So LA School. It turns out we've been talking in a way about this approach to architecture the whole semester. Uh, everything we do uh, is uh, in this course so far seems to be pretty heavily influenced by this analysis. And uh, I think it's worth taking a look back at this course, uh, what we've done so far. And if we had a whiteboard, I would start drawing on that. But imagine this diagram that when we first started, we were talking about the Anthropocene, design in the Anthropocene. And that's really a future looking framing of um, humanity in the 21st century. So big, a big picture view. What, and to narrow it more specifically, the reference point that should be driving you in your entire education is how am I going to make sure that that thing I did back uh, earlier in the 21st century where I spent four or five years at Wentworth doing that degree thing I did that I'm still paying off the loans for, how do I make sure that that was worth it? Because there's no guarantee that what you're doing right now is worth the time and money you're investing in it. And if you think you're guaranteed uh, return on investment, then think again. Some of your classmates will find that uh, they shouldn't have done this. It wasn't worth it because it costs a lot of money plus four years. But some of your classmates are going to say, this was the best thing I ever did was get an architectural education. And you want to be on the right side of that line. So, and that's not automatic. Um, your professors, it's, we do the best we can, but you can't count on us. We're number four. You are responsible for your own education. Your schooling does the best it can. We're doing the best we can. But there's a gap between what the school can do and what you need to do for your education. And that gap, where you end up in that gap, depends on what you bring to it. And so I'm making this explicit right from the beginning. I'm connecting your educational experience to the fate of the world. Uh, and this is, in a way, an optimistic thing. I would like to think that you might possibly, in the coming decades, have an influence on where the world ends up. And so um, this is us being optimistic. And so in order to help guarantee uh, that you guys are effective uh, in your careers, uh, I am framing the entire course and hoping that you rethink your entire approach to education in the context of the challenges of the 21st century. Um, how's that going? Is that working? Is that a useful thing? Or is it just too much pressure? Am I putting too much pressure on you? The fate of the world depends on you? Is that too much? Well, let me back off a little bit. So we're kind of practicing. This is a rehearsal for the moments of truth that you will face in your career. So we're getting ready. This is, this is Save the World Boot Camp. Um, so this is a safe space. We're all friends. We're doing our best. Uh, we're helping each other out. And we want to practice for those moments of truth that you face in your careers where you could make a difference. And it might be making the difference in saving the world. It might be making the difference between um, getting the promotion, not getting the promotion. It might actually be making the difference uh, between having the power to do evil and harm to the world or not. It's really up to you. This is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower you to take control of what you do. Whether you, and with great power, comes yes thank you and so um, hopefully my job is to empower you your job is to take responsibility for that and I can only lay down guidelines and give you hints so um, 
the first lecture frames that situation, the Anthropocene, the world uh, hangs in the balance, it could go either way. Uh, the second lecture was about, uh, very directly, I was answering the question, uh, based on the first lecture, it wouldn't be crazy for you guys to ask the question, well, is it, it seems hopeless. Your reading was learning to die in the Anthropocene, so we have to in a way, what you're saying is that in order to be effective, we have to give up right from the start. And um, that might be true. That, I think I might believe that, that you have to realize that you, uh, like I realize I'm going to die someday. And so everything I do um, in the meantime, uh, there's a limit to what I, the impact of I. Um, we're all going to die. Um, and that, in a way, makes it more important that I jump out of bed and do the best I can because uh, it's, I only have a few opportunities to make a difference. Um, so, in that context, has any, is it possible to make a difference? Is there any way that architecture can do anything? And the answer is yes. Made in Colombia. They took the worst situation ever in human history, if you measure it by murder rate, and they turned it into one of the best situations in human history. They flipped the thing right around. It was a brilliant jujitsu move, where you're being attacked by this huge monster, and you skillfully step aside and trip that monster and build a beautiful city on top, on the back of that drug cartel monster. Um, it's a miracle. And lo and behold, it turns out that one of the key instruments for that jujitsu move was architecture. So um, it's such a, a wonderful positive example. It turns out it's not the first time uh, because they did it in Singapore, they did it in the Netherlands, uh, they've done it in a lot of places that have faced really, really difficult circumstances. And they had to get really serious to turn it around because it was, you know, you have a lot to lose, uh, so you might as well take bold steps. And so that's kind of the, the, the outline for a good solution that we looked at in the second lecture uh, about reflexivity, the key characteristic that <clears throat> I'm putting forward of these positive moves is reflexivity. Not coincidentally, it is related to jiu-jitsu, isn't it? What do you, does anyone do martial arts? I've never done martial arts. No one does martial arts? Okay, I'll drop that analogy then. I'll save it for the next group. Um, when there is someone who can teach us about how martial arts work. Um, so then we went uh, from made in Colombia and ref reflexivity to look at more deeply, to try to understand how this works. What were the problems, uh, and so we looked at inform, um, informal settlements because the biggest single condition that dominates the Abura Valley of Medellin, it is informality rising up the slopes that created the conditions for, uh, for the jiu-jitsu move of architecture to make it one of the best places in the world to live. And, you know, if you are looking for a place to take your honeymoon in the next 10 years uh, or take a trip, Medellin. Uh, we're looking into making Medellin the destination of a travel studio. Back in 2009 when Manuel Delgado and I went there, we were looking at it as a, a potential site for a study abroad semester, Medellin, Colombia. It would be a great study abroad semester. So won't be in time to help you guys have an alternative to Berlin, but someday, perhaps. So informality, from there we went to the counterpoint of informality, which uh, we studied last week uh, and Wednesday, is the American dream overseas. How does the cultural construction of U.S. lifestyle, how the the, one of the key uh, lines of the reading was that the American dream is broadcast daily around the world for the consumption of other societies and other cultures. 
And when you ask them what the positive future looks like, you go to Africa and you say, what does the future look like for you? You go to Asia, you say, what does the future look like for you? Latin America, what does a positive future look like to you? Uh, especially if you're asking an audience of architects. They say, well, we're going to have a car and we're going to live in this nice house in a gated community outside the city. It looks a lot like the American dream. And it turns out that the American dream uh, has, especially Southern California real estate, has served as a very powerful blueprint for the construction of the future of the most optimistic and aspiring and affluent classes of the rest of the world. Which brings us back to that uh, population chart. Turns out it's not population that's going to continue to crush the world or determine whether the world is crushed faster or slower. It's the rate of consumption and the consumption models that lead to environmental degradation. So it's it's environmentally destructive consumption patterns um, that, that is a, a, system, a system encoded, created, and put, uh, put before the world as a model of future development by the United States. The power of the United States in the world is, is waning. That, it's decreasing very rapidly relative to China and the European Union. Uh, for various reasons, but for the time being, even as our economic dominance is sliding in the world, our cultural dominance, not much of a change. When students sit in an architecture classroom around the world, the things they're studying are the same things you're studying. And uh, when they sit in a class like this, the things they're studying are the things you're studying except they're studying these Southern California real estate developments as a model for practice. They're saying, okay, here we go. Let's do this outside of Lusaka, Namibia. Let's do this outside of every city in Africa, every city in Asia, every city in Latin America. It's a model for emulation. And in the last few decades of uh, the U.S. cultural influence on the world, the next few decades of your professional practice, you have an opportunity to complicate the US model of architectural practice. You have an opportunity to say, yeah, it looks great, but is there a way to have this great lifestyle of luxury, happiness, joy, high degree of education, high degree of, of health and welfare, with a fraction of the impact. And so that's why you study in tech one, two, three, passive systems first, active systems second. Because you're, the job of your professional education is to make a very attractive model for the good life, not just for your clients here in the United States, but for societies around the world to say, hmm, Maybe we can have a really good life and a decreased impact because that's part of the good life. You guys have the opportunity, you have the obligation to rewrite the code for the good life in your careers. The code that you're rewriting says luxury, sure. Beautiful design, sure. Health, safety, welfare, education, good uh, diets, active exercise, lower traffic congestion, all of the things that you are training to design for. How can you do it at a fraction of the impact environmentally? And this class is kind of connecting the dots between you doing that for your wealthy US clients and as a pro on, a, on a project by project basis to the impacts that could be having in the future in, during your careers, to rewriting the manual, the blueprint, redrawing the blueprint for the good life for the rest of the world. So that your projects that you're doing in the US during your careers are actually serving 
as a model for systemic change, not just in the U.S., but everywhere else. Because they're going to be looking at what you do, and they're going to be copying it in China, Latin America, and Africa, especially Africa. Don't forget Africa. Okay. So that brings us to this week. Um, our weeks start on Friday. Um, <clears throat> where, where did that American dream come from? And we're moving back in time. We started in the year 2100 uh, or 2060, really, to make it within the time frame of your careers. 2060 was identified as peak human. We're going to hit peak human around 10 billion around 2060, more or less. And around the same time, we're going to be experiencing uh, deep, deep into uh, climate change, sea level rise, all of those things that uh, your worst nightmares from the thing. And the thing, of course, is planetary death. That's really the main reference point for your careers and your lifetimes is the thing. Um, and so you'll be experiencing the thing in full force by 2060, and you'll be solving it. That'll be the main focus uh, of your careers. And so, uh, just you, there's no choice. It will have to be the main focus of your careers. And so we went from 2060 uh, down to um, the last decade or so of the model in Medellin, uh, potential for reflexivity in other places, and we go way back in history, back to the Dutch challenges. Uh, so we go back and forward in these sweeping moves throughout history. And then from reflexivity, go to informal settlements that really didn't get going in full force until the 60s and 70s, post-war period of displacement accelerating displacement of large populations of internally displaced peoples, refugees from warfare, economic, uh, and increasingly from environmental disasters. Um, and the informal, uh, and so the post-war period, then the American dream over the seas is really booming in the 90s. We looked at it in Indonesia and in China it really started full force in the 90s with the transformation of Shanghai, Dubai, uh, Singapore, the, real, the gated communities outside of uh, all these cities. Uh, so we were firmly in the 80s and 90s uh, during that. This lecture, it's really about what happened in the 70s and 80s. That's kind of our time period now. And there's a significant overlap uh, between this topic and a more purely architecturally focused topic, which we skimmed over in the History Theory 2 course last summer. Um, but in the other concentrations, they spend, I think especially adaptive interventions, they look a lot um, at uh, postmodernism. Have you heard of that term, postmodernism? By the way, and I asked you this last summer, but I want to check in again. What, are, what is, what's happening right now? Is this postmodern or modern? Hmm? This is postmodern. Post I would say both. Both. So let's raise our hands. Postmodern. Modern? Both? Okay. Do you want to? So it's not clear. There's like no, there's no consensus, clearly. How many people didn't raise their hands? <laughs> okay. So since you didn't express yourself by raising your hand, what are you thinking? Why, why is this such a hard question? You're in that class? Who's in that class? Is that a lot of reading? Yeah. Is it a hard okay. class? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, modernism beyond the West. Uh, I guess, in a sense, I can kind of agree with what he was saying, maybe both. Because, 
because there's always room for like a modernist, like more new new changes, I guess. Yeah. Right? You said no? Okay, go ahead, Tar. He doesn't mean it? He's a postmodern guy. Are you a postmodern guy? <coughs> so, it's a tough question. <coughs> Some of us just avoid it because it's just an annoying distraction from what really matters, which is we want to solve problems, right? Who's with me? Let's solve some problems. Uh, yeah. Call it whatever you want, but let's solve some problems. But then we circle back around. We say, does it help us solve problems to understand a larger uh, set of principles? Are there larger principles that help us be more effective in solving problems? If yes, then let's, you know, give me, give me some of that, right? So let's go down this path. What does politics have to do with architecture? A lot or nothing? If uh, we had more time, I would do a spectrum where Tyler would be here, he says a lot, and who would be over here saying it has nothing to do. Politics and architecture are two different things. Politics is a professional responsibility to serve the interests of your client no matter what they are. Like theory. Up to you. What matters most, practice or theory? Probably I mean, practice. Okay. So let's pretend um, that we have the two poles. Politics has a lot to do with architecture. Uh, in practice, because that's helping. In theory. In practice? In theory. In theory. In theory, politics and architecture have nothing to do with each other. Okay? And so now decide where you are. Well, would those both be correct? Would they both be like the same answer? That's too like sophisticated for this early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Whenever, you, whenever we're faced with a binary choice, this or that, we always want to say both. It depends. Yeah, but this is, and like, of course, Architecture has like nothing to do with politics theoretically because they're trying to separate it. Um, but like, like in practice, it is. So I feel like they're like, I don't know, both the same thing because it's like a double negative. In practice, <laughs> it is political. I feel like it because that's like we've been talking about this whole time. A lot of people like throw money into architecture in order to create like a political change or to um, or to like house polit like politics, money that they're trying to launder. So it can be political. Yeah. Politics have an influence on in architecture. Politics can have an influence on architecture. What's an example of architecture with no politics, or as close to no politics as we can get? Like residential housing? Residential right. housing, right. Clear example of no politics. Wait a minute. More like Wait, whoa. Not like, Wait. not like. Not like single, like single, like, like our homes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> our homes are not political. Yeah. Oh wait. Well, yours is. Wait. <laughs> 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 Who lives in a non-political home? Define non-political home. Yeah. Well, <laughs> these guys. Oh. How? In what I way guess, is your home well, non-political? Arguing, po ar arguing politics isn't the same as having like a political home. Like, um, as in like. <laughs> <laughs> what like political force is like making us like live in these houses I guess right? or what impacts what's the impacts of this architecture what's the political impact of your architecture so where do you guys live um, yeah. like in the hills of western mass okay in the hills of western mass and in the woods of New Hampshire, in the, woods of New Hampshire. Yeah. the ultimate non-political <laughs> home <laughs> right? or is it except for the <coughs> Yeah, it, in the land of live free or die, they still exert control. They make you pay taxes. They make sure you don't build anywhere near the wetlands. 
right? You can't do whatever you want in your land. Um, so it's still governed by political things. And um, because it's out in the woods, you drive everywhere. Political impact, right there. Environmental impact, right there. It means you're more like Wyoming and less like Manhattan. So uh, that model, if it were repeated throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout Latin America, would quickly uh, plunge the earth into uh, disaster. So it's political. If, it, if you extrapolated... Do you mean like this, this practice of like a single home? Like a single family home or this like rural setting? That whole thing is, is a package. The single family home on 10 acres uh, in the woods uh, with two or three car garage because you can't go anywhere without the car. Boom. If, to the extent that that gets replicated, it's a project. And as a project, what's the big deal, right? It's just one house in the woods. I'm not hurting anyone. But if you extrapolate it from project to system to culture, which is the test, that's the test platform for architecture. As a single project, no big deal. It's great. As if you ex extrapolate it to a system, not so great. If it becomes a cultural norm, disastrous, right? And so as long as it stays, as long as that's the only house, uh, we're good. As long as Africa and China don't copy it, we're good. But they are copying it. So that's an example of a method for pulling out the, imp the larger implications of design. That is worth. We saw it in the Dutch example. Remember the Alexander Plotz uh, mapping? What if you develop the green heart of the Netherlands? And everything was like this, you know, you know, all those wooden houses. That that's a Dutch architectural method, which is very interesting for testing the impacts of a design proposal, and it's worth doing. It's not the only thing. It's not the most important thing necessarily. It shouldn't be the main thing designing whatever it is you're working on in studio right now. But it's available to us. It is a method that is available to us. Uh, for evaluating the success and failure of a design strategy. And then, especially when we got to informa, informal settlements, we faced this question. Does every human body have the right to occupy space? Yeah. Well, be careful what you say because this has implications. Again, no problem. You guys are all fine, right? If someone came in here and uh, went to Ray and said, um, I want to sit there, that would be crazy, right? And we would all jump to Ray's defense, saying, she's sitting there. Just leave her alone, right? But if we have a homeless person on Skid Row, like Ben's analysis that he brought to us uh, early in the course, um, do they have a right? Does that human body have a right to occupy space? Apparently, people differ on the response. And we get it, as we get into the reading, this is kind of a crucial question for the LA school. And here's something that, here's a, a, a phrase that is good, we're going to be using more and more as we go deeper and deeper into the course. When you guys are highlighting things in your analysis projects, you are identifying formal spatial institutional arrangements. And this phrase uh, is something that emerged out of this course from the, your, the people who came through this course before you. We used to say, yeah, architecture, it's all about form, right? We design buildings and there they are. We look at the building, it's a form, right? This is the main thing we do as architects. We design forms and there they are. And we present them with this frame 
And the space is, what do you mean, the space? Space has nothing to do with it. Yeah, there's space inside. Let's look at that space. But the space outside, it's just what's left over, right? But hold on. One of the fundamental principles of urbanism is that the space that's left over sometimes is the most important thing. The space between buildings. To the extent that you guys, do you know what a Noli plan is? Mm -hmm. Right? You have excellent studio professors who told you what a Noli plan is. What is a Noli plan? Figure ground. It's a figure ground. Yeah. And so why is a figure ground useful as an analytical method, a tool in architecture? It shows you where buildings are in open space. Yeah. And um, a lot of our professors here, they really like to get you guys to think beyond just what the architectural form that you're making and to look instead at the spaces that you're making. That the space itself, some of, has any of your professors said this? The space itself is more important than the building. Have you heard that from any of your professors? Who said that? Mm -hmm. like public space. But also, some of your professors like Jim Costaris, Margarita Iglesia, Manuel Delgado, these names ring a bell? Ingrid Strong, ring a bell? Some of these professors go so far as to say that the, d the building that you design should be the outcome of the spaces you design. So design the right space and change the form of the building so that it produces that space. Ignacio Cardona. Do you know this guy? Yeah? yeah. He's good, right? Yeah. Wow. So uh, this is the attitude, this is actually one of the key principles of what separates the architecture of the 20th century from the architecture of the 21st century. We used to, especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we said, design a beautiful building, and we'll put it on the cover of a magazine. And if it's surrounded by ugliness, we'll crop that photo tightly so we don't see the ugliness. We just see your beautiful shape, your sculptural form. Thank you, Frank Gehry, right? Etc. That's kind of... Uh, what we did best in the 20th, late 20th century in architecture schools is we made beautiful forms, but often at the expense of the spaces around. And so we've shifted gears with photographers like Iwan Bon. Have you heard of Iwan Bon? Anyone here of Iwan Bon? Have you ever seen a photograph done by Iwan Bon? If you've ever se have you ever seen a photograph of anything designed by Zaha Hadid or Rem Kolhas or anyone whose name you could name? He took all those photos. Iwan Ban is the single biggest, he dominates. He takes more of the famous photos than everybody else combined. Just, there's, there's basically, he dominates. Well, he breaks all the rules. He says, he photographed the ICA, um, not like this, but like this. So all the parking lots and the snow banks of gray slush and, and the emptiness and the broken asphalt, he took a photograph of the ICA like that. It's like, oh my God, this guy is breaking all the rules. He also takes photographs of famous buildings uh, with people in them. And he says, I'm really a portrait photographer. I prefer to take my portrait photos uh, in the context of powerful architecture. So he always puts people in the architecture. Again, that's against the rules. My professors, when I was going to architecture school in the 1980s, believe it or not, um, we'd put up uh, a, a rendering and they'd say, ah, oh, 
Why are there people in your get the get them out of there? Right? They were they were jerks. Um, but so they would talk to us that way. But you weren't allowed to put people in your in your architectural drawings. Crazy, right? Things have changed. So the space around the architecture matters a lot. And so when this course first got going, uh, we would talk about formal spatial arrangements. And we talk about, in, in studio, we talk about formal spatial. It's not just the form, it's the space and the form and how they work together. Formal spatial arrangements is what we're looking at. But there's a third thing that turns out we had to add it because so many people's analyses had to do with the institutional arrangements that were being uh, promoted and activated and instrumentalized by the formal spatial. So there's the formal spatial and then there's the institutional. And we've been talking about this the whole course. Let's make it explicit now. So when you do your analysis, be aware of the fact that you're looking at the architectural forms, the spaces that are produced by those architectural forms, in relationship to the institutional relationships. So if we were looking at the Grand Plaza in Mexico City, do you know this? Does anyone know? Or if we were looking at City Hall Plaza, right? City Hall Plaza is what it is in part because City Hall is what it is. If that were a department store, City Hall Plaza would be a completely different architectural experience. But because it has this <coughs> institutional um, imperative, this is the City Hall, this is the symbol of Boston, and it looms over the space, it charges that space, it transforms that space so that the mayor can say, let's have a concert series in the summer, let's have a hub week. It has a, a symbolic charge to it because it is, because of the institution. Does that make sense? So let's get into it. What are the politics of urban space? The LA school is really about that. Um, so who's been to LA? What do you think of L.A.? It's great, right? I lived in L.A. for one year. You did? Yeah. Where in L.A.? Santa Monica. Okay. That's... Which uh, is the safest area, actually. Yeah, and it's over here. Yeah. Um, so, what, what was your experience like? We have a first-hand witness. You guys have been to L.A. too? So what do you guys think of L.A.? It's really cool, big city, uh, hard to, but if you want to go from area to area, if you use the public transportation, it might take a while. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a car there for sure. You need a car. Uh, but when did you live there? 2015. So it, it's changing though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the train doesn't take to, the train is only in downtown. The Both train is only in downtown? Yeah. When I lived in L.A. in the 90s, there's no train. There's zero train. They're absolutely zero. So now that they have trains, it's like, oh my God, how did that happen? What's, there have never been any trains in L.A., have there? Not the public transport. Well. Like the one that got them there? Next week is... We're going to look at L.A. again next week. It turns out it used to be, it used to have the most extensive train system of any city in the world. Go figure. And then it had zero. It went from the biggest to zero. How did that happen? Stay tuned. You're going to love it. Everyone loves the automobile topic. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's hard to get around, <clears throat> but it's getting better. They have bicycle lanes. They have bike share. They have bus. They've invested huge amounts in the bus system, and they have a train system. So they're trying to change it, in part because of L.A. school analysis, in part because architects, planners, geographers, social scientists focused on L.A. in the 90s, and they said, holy cow, 
we've created a monster. And, in, and at the center of that is Mike Davis. Mike Davis's book, City of Quartz, that you read, Fortress LA, that was a turning point. It was a landmark piece of literature of architectural criticism that helped LA to wake up and say, oh my God, if we don't turn this thing around, uh, we're going to become like made in Colombia back in the drug war days uh, because we have gangs, we have all this trouble, and there's only so much that uh, a militarized police department can do to turn things around. They never said, let's stop having a militarized police department. They basically have said, same as in Made in Colombia, let's have a militarized police department, but let's also do other things to soften, uh, to encourage people uh, to behave better. Let's reduce the conditions of isolation. Um, so a few reference points. If we were studying, if we were taking this course in the 70s or in the 80s like I did, um, the first time I took this course, um, we wouldn't talk about L.A. L.A. would not even be a thing. We'd study cities. You know, back then we knew what a city was. New York, Boston, Chicago, these are cities. L.A., that's a weird thing. It's a bunch of suburbs spread out across this 100-mile wide basin uh, that have increasingly become interconnected. Uh, is it a city? Uh, you could call it a city, I guess, but it's not like a city. It's not Berlin. It's not London. It's not Paris, New York, Boston, Rome. It's not a city, right? And so we had this idea of what is a city and how do cities work? Cities start in a center, they grow out, and as they grow out, the center of the city goes up. And that's how cities work. And that's, we knew. LA right? is totally different. Totally different. LA, wanting to be more like a real city back in the 80s, they said, well, we have, a Trump, we have an image problem here. People don't think we're a city. Let's artificially induce developers to build high-rise buildings. And so they did that. They incentivized developers to build a high-rise downtown. That's the only reason there are any towers in Los Angeles is because of these artificial incentives to transform the image of LA. So that makes LA more like Dubai and uh, you know these false cities that aren't and Pudong. That there's no real demand for this. It was a conscious choice of uh, the the political leaders. So the first condition about LA has to do with the intensification of the concentration of wealth and poverty, right? What's the worst thing about LA? Homeless. Homeless people, right? Like Ben showed us, right? Yeah. What's the worst thing about LA? Homeless people. Homeless people. Gangsters. Gangs in South Central, right? Great for movies. We love movies about the gangs of LA. So, the United States, as we've talked about, and the world, has become much more income unequal. Uh, the immigration uh, of uh, agricultural workers uh, from Mexico and other parts of Latin America has intensified the influx of um, very low-wage uh, seasonal workers that sometimes they're out there picking our oranges and our tomatoes and our asparagus and sometimes they're moving to LA to get closer because there's still a strong manufacturing base especially the garment industry in LA did you know that um, but a weird thing happened in the 70s where um, if we just look at this part this is what we think of is what happens with capitalism right you have the blue line um, is the 90 percent. We've looked at this in multiple different ways uh, of income inequality uh, globally. And we've looked at it in Hans Rosling's Gapminder uh, visualizations. But here we go. This is, how the, how, this is what we all assume is how the world works, is as the economy grows, um, 
there is a growth everywhere. A rising tide raises all boats is what we used to say without lying. But now when you hear someone say that, they're lying to you. A rising tide, if they're, if they're sailors and they're not using it as an analogy, they're not lying. Rising tides do raise all boats equally. But the economic analogy stopped uh, around 1970 because the rising tide of economic growth does not raise all boats. The, the 90 percent, uh, in, this is the United States, the income of the 90 percent of the population has stayed the same or gone down in terms of real uh, purchasing power parity, PPP, the real economic power of income. Your parents uh, have it stayed like this, where the top 10%, all the growth in the economy since the 70s has basically concentrated at the top of the income group. None of the benefits have accrued to this group. And the only way this group, the 90%, has maintained this level is by uh, taking the household and saying, okay, the father's working, but uh, <laughs> that's not enough. Okay, mom, can you go to work too? Because the mortgage, paying for college. How many people have mothers who work? outside the home. Is that all? It's not everyone? How many mothers don't work outside the home? Impressive. Okay. Um, so that's, we've done all these things, and this has been, um, let's look at this quickly. Let's see. Dividing the country into five rows. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, Firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Where do the architects Now let's line them up according to their wealth. The poorest people on the left, no. wealthiest on the right, just well, a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work.
work, we need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about yeah. 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And, and it's yes, in the middle. Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, <coughs> clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change, and the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better <coughs> off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money. But do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. So that is a, a better graph of consumption and impact than population. <clears throat> So is everybody okay? Yeah. Do, you, do we need to percentile? talk about it? Hmm? How many are in each percentile? Um, twenty percent. I mean, oh, no, you mean how population. many people? Yeah. Well, it's three hundred eleven million. Three hundred eleven million divided, divided by a hundred is wait, don't tell me, don't tell me. Three point one one million. Yeah. So three million people mm -hmm. in each percentile. So there are three million people who have that 400 percent. Well, we've already seen other statistics where the wealthiest 300 people in the world, most of whom are in the United States, control the same amount of wealth as the poorest three billion, so about half of humanity. So, and these statistics are from 2009, before the most recent uh, tax code change that uh, 
gives a temporary tax break to the middle people or the upper middle people that will go away after a year or two and gives a permanent huge tax break to the top 10%. So as bad as this looks, it is in the process, <coughs> it has in the past 10 years gotten much, much worse and with a huge acceleration starting last year with the tax break. So, um, okay, whatever, right? But what is the impact on the built environment? So we were looking at that uh, on Wednesday and the last week with the American Dream overseas, where in order, like what do they do with all that money? Um, one of the really striking questions is, uh, is it true that the wealthy people are the job creators, right? We like to say that the wealth at the top will trickle down, right? Have you heard that it trickle down trickle theory? Down. It's a lie. And we like to think that a rising uh, economy raises all boats, lie. Um, then there's the most recent lie that seems to work really well, which is the wealthy people, the concentrations of wealth, they're the job creators, right? So give them a break. The more you, con the more you reward the hard work of these CEOs, the more jobs they're going to create. Turns out to be the biggest lie of all. When a CEO, um, maybe we'll move to the next thing, because I think that it's part of this one. This is now available on Netflix. The thing I know about this Mini Cooper is it is small. We are in proportion. Me and my car. My name is Robert Reich. I was Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. Of all developed nations, the United States has the most unequal distribution of income. And we're surging toward even greater inequality. 1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income That was the Great Depression. That was the Great Recession. The two biggest collapses in the country. I make 50000 a year, working 70 hours a week. The middle class is struggling. The people occasionally say to me, what nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boomed, but you had very low inequality. Do you know Robert Reich? I do, and he's a communist. When I was a kid, bigger boys would pick on me. I think it changed my life. I had to protect people from the people who would beat them up economically. Who is actually looking out for the American worker? The answer is nobody. If workers don't have power, if they don't have a voice, their wages and benefits start eroding. We are losing equal opportunity in America. Any one of you who feels cynical, just consider where we have been. So that's a preview for a movie uh, based on a book uh, where Instead of Bernie Sanders saying we should be more like Scandinavia, uh, we should make sure that we're taking care of the majority of the people. Uh, we don't have to look over, his big punchline is we don't have to look overseas for a model for how things could be better. We can look at the United States in the great boom uh, between, 19, between World War II and the 1970s. And so, uh, that's, in the 1970s, that's when things kind of went kaflooey. With the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, Reg Reaganomics, um, the deregulation, the erosion of big government uh, to get it out of the way. And he basically, especially in his more recent work called Saving Capitalism, he makes the point that capitalism is not the problem. Monopoly capitalism is the problem. And uh, government is not in the way of free market uh, functioning. There is no free market without the framework that government provides. He says this is a false dichotomy. And then translating that into architecture is uh, what we do next, is we look at what happens when you deregulate. 
what happens when you allow whatever's going to happen, you say, bring it. Let's just let things happen. And that's when you get the concentration of wealth at the top of the income uh, spectrum starts to transform the built environment, which is basically what we were looking at in Dubai, in Shanghai, in Indonesia, around Jakarta. Uh, we see the transformation of the built environment and ar through architecture that impacts everybody. And the direct cause of that is this massive mobilization of economic power to build things for the benefit of the wealthiest uh, consumer class majority. And that's true whether you're talking about the global south, uh, the emerging economies of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, <clears throat> or if you look at the United States. And uh, be in part because of what's happened since the 70s, LA went from being the weird outlier cities are, you know, see, we know what cities are, but LA's a different animal. Um, LA went from being the weird oddball in the group to being the class president, right? All of a sudden, LA is, is the paradigm by which every city in the world, including Berlin, Paris, Rome, New York, Boston, Chicago, every city in the world has gone through the process of LAification. And it's because of that LA is the built form that emerges from extreme concentrations of wealth in a small group of people. When you concentrate, when you have a smooth curve, uh, you get the Chicago School. This is the old model. This is a, a cartoon version of the Paris, London, Rome. Uh, and this is a very important uh, thing in, has forever been a very important thing in all classes like this, where we, we take architecture and we look at cities. Right? If we want to understand Rome, London, Paris, New York, Chicago, uh, Boston in the old days, this is what we look at. Uh, where uh, people commute, well, especially in the United States. This is the Chicago model. If you put Lake Michigan here, it looks like Chicago. Instead of, if you don't have this, it actually intensifies what happens to the west of Chicago. Who's been to Chicago? What's that like? <coughs> this went downtown. Yeah. yeah. The loop. It's a really strong downtown center, and yeah. then kind of everything else just fades away. What an amazing core, right? It's boom. And it's not vertical because uh, rich people need a place to park their money like Dubai. It's vertical because people are commuting in from di large distances. And uh, the downtown area is geographically constrained. There's a limit to how you, know, you hit a wall of strong residential zone. So the downtown cannot expand as you need more commercial space. It has to go up. And all that transportation is concentrated in the loop. So Chicago is a brilliant demonstration of how the more the city grows, the higher the downtown has to get. Because of these constraints, it can't expand, and it's got all the transportation infrastructure. Right, beautiful. Um, and then there's this zone of working men's homes, uh, and then uh, that is now emptied. It, during the 80s and 90s, it kind of emptied out because of, for various reasons that we might or might not look at. But to cut to the chase, this is a classic concentric circle model of how cities used to be. They, grow outward, and the further they grow outward, the more they grow upward at the center. Everyone good? And a whole several decades of economic modeling that confirms that, yeah, the economics of land value requires this. The reason you have tall buildings is because the land gets more and more valuable. In order to take advantage of that value, 
you put more and more architecture on it. Then you can justify the cost of the additional structure. The taller a building gets, the more the cost of the building is consumed by the massive structural systems that have to be uh, injected into the building in order to keep it from swaying in the wind and in order to transport people vertically. The elevators of the World Trade Center uh, took up the entire footprint of the ground floor. Um, there was a space around that you walk around, but then the whole base of it was all elevators all the time. And as the ele as as you go higher and higher, it becomes less and less elevator, less and less structure, and more and more actual usable space. So it's the opposite of the Burj Khalifa. The higher you get, the more usable space there is because it was a, a rectangle. And that was part of the economic model. The economics of skyscrapers, and to a large extent, used to determine the form of the skyscrapers, interestingly. And the Burj Khalifa is a clear demonstration of the opposite. It's the economics are now about symbols, iconography, and parking investment and maintaining the value of the building. Uh, so it has to be the tallest in the building in the world so that its investment value remains high. So what happens when you have high concentrations of wealth uh, in a few people? So what you do is you create uh, edge cities where you create gated community uh, gated communities in the suburbs and uh, to the extent that the downtown area matters at all the downtown area will either matter or it won't matter if you want it to matter then you artificially create tall buildings to change the image and you fortify the different architectural elements, either building by building or, as we read in the reading, entire neighborhoods, uh, several blocks around the Frank Gehry uh, Concert Hall, Bunker Hill, uh, is increasingly architecturalized as a bunker, or at least at the time of this writing in the, when was that published? 80, in the 80s. It was the transformation of Los Angeles into a fortified uh, landscape. And that's what happens with the concentration of wealth uh, defending itself against the vast sea of uh, poverty uh, and threat. And one thing that would be easily confused in the built environment is if we look at the relative land area of cities, most cities, when you look at these uh, images that you're using for your analyses, the majority of the built fabric of cities is always residential. And it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, well, look at the relative area of the informal settlements. Let's say if we're looking at Nairobi. Look at the area of all these informal settlements and look at the area of wealthy gated communities and look at the area of high-rise condominiums and office buildings. It looks like it's kind of 50-50. About half of the people of Nairobi are extremely well-off middle class. And about the other half of the people of Nairobi are poor, right? Because we look at the architecture, we look at the uh, aerial photographs and we say, yeah, 50-50. Is that right? What's wrong with that assessment? About 50% of the area is wealthy. About 50% of the area is poverty. What's wrong with that? They're equal. They're equal, right? It's about half and half. We could do better, right? but it's not bad. We have a middle class, but the wealthiest half judging by the area, they're wealthy. What's wrong with that? What I see is the informal settlement is 70, but it's just 30. It's 70 percent of the people, but it's 50 percent of the space. So 
as architects, when we look at these places, we have to translate the space, the area, the form. Uh, it may be 50% of the city, but that doesn't mean it's 50% of the people, right? So that's a translation that we have to go through when we do these exercises for Wednesday. And we're going to have to do that for this one too. Uh, if it's 50-50, what is the proportion of informal settlement versus gated community wealth? If, if those are the only two categories that exist in places like Nairobi, that's an oversimplification. But let's say those are the only two categories that exist. Or we could say Rio, right? We looked at Rio de Janeiro, some of your work. Uh, if it's if the area is 50-50, what do you think the proportion of population is? It's not 50-50, because Osama says, no, the population density in the informal settlements is higher than in the gated communities. So what is the ratio? It looks like it's 50-50 in terms of area. What's the likely ratio in terms of population? So 75% live in 50% of the land, and 25% live in 50% of the land. That's what Osama says. Do you think it's higher, higher concentration of poverty, or is that too extreme? What do you guys think? Osama's putting it out there. <coughs> Who's going to... Higher. Yeah, it's a higher concentration. Thank you. It is a higher concentration. It's a much higher concentration. It's more like <clears throat> it's higher. It, should, it varies from place to place. Um, but it can be as much as 70%. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say Jakarta, because I did research on Jakarta. In Jakarta, the informal settlements look like about uh, like 20% or 15% of the area of the city, but 70% of the people live in that 20% of the city. And the affluent gated communities around Jakarta look like 30% um, of the city, but really it's, it represents 5% of the population. But that 5% is often purchasing three or four or five or six or 20 or 30 houses in those gated communities because they're investments, right? So it's, that's, that's the interpretation of this diagram that um, there's basically gated zones that are protected in uh, the outlying areas. There are gated, uh, uh, gated protected fortified areas in the center, and then there's the freeway that connects the two. So you go from your luxury uh, concrete and glass house here to your luxury concrete and glass <clears throat> uh, workplace at the center. And you get there in your glass and steel and rubber and plastic uh, little piece of private space that moves you from here to there. And so uh, Rem Kolhas. And you guys all know Rem Kolhas, right? Rem Kolhas? Rem Kolhas? Office of Metropolitan Architecture. China, uh, CCTV, that building. Raise your hand if you know Rem Kolhas. So raise your hand if you don't know Rem Kolhas. OK. Oh, that's interesting. Used to be that um, of all the star architects, Rem Kohlhaas was everybody's favorite star architect in school. All the students loved this Dutch guy. Um, um, we don't have time. But you pay attention. You'll see him everywhere from now on, now that the name is familiar. Um, I think <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> talk about two points. First, Ram Kolas is the father of all 21st architects, which is a very popular one. We are the Engels right now. He works under Ram Kolas. My second point I want to make is 
the, such as example countries like Nairobi, which is very rich and poor is very poor, so the socialist system invented in the states is not working over there. Well, the social system in Kenya is not. Every country kind of has its own history of how it got to where it is. But it's interesting that the two polar opposites, the United States and China, you know, communist China and freedom loving, d democratic, capitalist United States, it's converging towards the same outcomes extreme concentrations of wealth at the top in both systems. There is, there is no two systems that are more opposite, unless you bring in Cuba or Venezuela, but let's just talk China, United States. The outcomes are the same. It's really um, sobering, and it says a lot. But yes, Bjark Engels. You've heard of Bjark Engels? He's more famous than Rem Kohlhaas? Is that what you're saying? Money. And M MDR -V -V MVRDV, 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 have you heard of MVRDV? Vinnie Moss. So um, a lot of these firms emerged out of Rem Kohlhaas's practice. Rem Kohlhaas is probably more important for the, as uh, Ali has said, he is the father of 21st century architecture to a large extent. Um, and maybe I'll inject a little bit of Rem Kohlhaas into the course just to fill in that blank. And maybe it should be in that history theory class you guys took last summer, if he's that important. So Los Angeles was marketed, uh, it's image making. We talked about it in American Dream Overseas, how important the Hollywood movie industry is in promoting this and uh, projecting out the good life of the United States. Uh, when I was in Indonesia, people would say, oh, United States, boom, 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 everyone has guns and fast cars and they have sex all the time. Um, it's all from the Hollywood movies. Rambo was the big movie that year that I moved there. And this is, uh, you can tell who the winners and losers are. Um, through all the this, this symbol system that is in part produced by architecture. So here's the inequality map of Los Angeles. Um, the dissimilarity, this is an indication of dissimilarity based on the 2010 census of uh, racial location. So the ideal of the United States is we are a nation of immigrants, we come to the United States, we have equal opportunity, and we all strive to uh, become educated and successful and, and, and rise up uh, in the ranks of the middle class. And that's the, that's the ideal aspirations still. No matter how different the ideal is from the reality, it still is what drives us. And arguably, it, it should be what drives us. We just shouldn't have any delusions about how close we are to uh, doing what we aspire to do. We should not have any delusions that we're making progress and things are getting better. Things are getting, things are not getting better. Things are actually getting worse. Um, we ended slavery in 1865. We had a rapid and dramatic reintegration of former slaves into U.S. society throughout the country from 1865 to 1895 or so. And then the Republican Party made a deal. There was a tied election and they said, listen, we will uh, give the Democrats the election, but you have to remove the Union troops from the South. And the Democrats said, okay, it's a deal. And at that point, we were plunged back into the depths of a reconstruction of the conditions of slavery, uh, but without slavery. It was, all of a sudden, it was, it's called the Jim Crow South, where you could segregate. It was not illegal to say, this is whites only, and this is non-white. You could designate places to live. That was totally legal. Not only was it legal, it was central to the U.S. government housing policy. 
that was part of every federal financing, zoning, housing regulation is this is for whites, this is for blacks. And that was true until, guess when? 1965. The Civil Rights Act of 1965 made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of race. But until then, it wasn't just legal, it was part of the government policy. And since then, it just, it doesn't change. It actually gets worse, because every time you change the overt racist laws, there's a new system that rises up to take its place. So now there are real estate practices that prevent um, racial mixing to a large extent. And we don't, we don't have to look at the principles behind the laws, we can look at the outcomes. So red dots are white, uh, white residents, blue are uh, black, um, yellow is Hispanic, green is Asian, uh, and that's what we see. The, the racial concentration of distinct groups, and this is uh, the mathematics behind this, registers a score of 65. Anything above 60 is extreme segregation. Here is uh, this looks like Detroit. Detroit. Can you see the municipal boundary of Detroit here? So black, white. <clears throat> That's a score of 80. Do you, do you know what that line is? It's the city of Detroit and the wealthy suburbs. And so this is an extreme uh, demonstration of something we're going to talk about next week called white flight where after World War II, anyone, anyone who wanted to move to a new house in the suburbs, uh, the federal government would give you low interest loans, low down payment, will build you a highway system to take you back and forth. And uh, you basically, it's cheaper to move out to a big, huge house in the suburbs with good school systems than it is to stay in your neighborhood in Detroit. And so it would actually cost you more money to stay where you are with a lot worse conditions than it is to move out. And so anyone who, anyone who wanted to moved out as long as you were white. If you're not white, <laughs> huh, that's different. And so that's what happened between the end of World War II in 1965 when it became illegal but the practice continued that's why things haven't changed between 65 and the 2010 census um, so other cities New York City Boston near that there's Wentworth right there right at the edge between the blue and the red between the black and the white Boston versus Chicago. So we see in the Chicago School diagram, we see these wedges that uh, follow transportation uh, infrastructure leading out from the core, complicating the, the core, the concentric pattern. There are these wedges of transportation infrastructure. So Frank Gehry's building uh, is characteristic. I think Mike Davis in the reading does an excellent job characterizing postmodern architecture. He calls it, what does he call it? How does Mike Davis characterize that Frank Gehry work? He calls it a dumb box. I don't know. I think that's unfair. It's not a dumb box, but it is a box. It's, it, there's no windows. This is the typical thing where you create this outward flamboyant appearance, but it's very much an inward looking building. And all of the Frank, he characterizes all of the Frank Gehry buildings, although it's not illustrated uh, well enough to really do what we needed to do. Um, and I'm not going to fix it because I don't have slides 
of the main project. He talks about the Loyola campus and the college buildings. Um, but basically, uh, you go to Strata Center in Cambridge. Has, has anyone been to that? It's kind of, it's kind of like that, right? It's, there's a flamboyant outward form, but the, the architecture, the, really the great stuff of that, and I love that building, by the way, it happens the inside. It's skylit. There's a pedestrian street, but it's an interiorized street. It's really kind of isolated from the outside, which makes it excellent for hostile conditions. And even when he brings it to Cambridge, Cambridge is not a hostile situation. It's about as benign, integrated. It's why I live there. It's so great. Um, it's not L.A. by any stretch. But the Frank Gehry building, you know, this is just a habit of design. He keeps replicating these fortified boxes no matter where he's designing for. Um, and the interiors are interconnected so that you never have to leave that luxury interior. Uh, you, you don't have to go down on the street, which is dominated by <coughs> traffic and the dangers of the public realm. And so this is downtown LA, the Buenaventura Hotel, uh, and the adjacent, well, that's the Buenaventura Hotel, the adjacent commercial mall. Uh, don't leave, stay in that protected, policed, surveilled space, and um, enjoy, <coughs> enjoy everything from the safety and luxury of the interior air-conditioned space. And this is why um, after, you know, on, uh, the Prudential Tower has that, uh, that bridge across Huntington Avenue, just down the street. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I like it, right? Yeah. It's nice to have, not to have to cross Huntington, because Huntington looks a lot like this, except with more cars, right? So yeah, it's good design. Well, what's the impact of that bridge? What are the politics of that bridge? I should have a picture of that bridge, but you've all seen it. You've all experienced it. It's better than this because you've all walked through it. Right? Has anyone not walked through it? So everybody's walked through it. Where's the bridge? Huntington Avenue. You should go. It's great. The shopping mall at the Prudential. I've never seen a bridge at the Prudential. The bridge that crosses over from Copley. Pedestrian the pedestrian bridge. bridge the I don't. Sorry. Like, well, you drive by every time. It's like it's right around. there. <laughs> it's like right down Huntington. It's hard to miss. You'll see. You'll see it. <laughs> really hard. Let's look it up. So you'll 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 see every mention of Rem Kohlhaas in your world, and you're going to see the bridge if you haven't already. Anyway, we love that bridge, right? Um. But what are the impacts of that bridge? And it doesn't mean we're bad people. Are we bad people? No. We are lovely people. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that that bridge it does not come with its negative impacts. As a matter of fact, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, uh, in the aftermath of that bridge, has said never again will anybody in the city of Boston ever build a bridge across a street. Never. It will never happen ever again. They've banished it. Why would they? Wow, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of government over, big government overreach. What, what do you even, why would they do that? Why would they say never again, a bridge like this? Keep people out. It prevents people from using the street. Thank you. It prevents people from using the street. The measure of a successful city is how many bodies you can stack up on the sidewalk. If this is what your city looks like, you're not going to get reelected. You need bodies on the street. But it's so, cold. is what? But it's cold. This is cool. No, it's cold. It's cold, right? Yeah. It's cold, but you have these lovely jackets. Okay. I still feel like in that area, though, the, sh the sidewalks are very populated. Yeah, Boston is a walking city. Boston is an exception to the L.A. school rule. 
people walk to work in Boston more than any other city in the United States. Hooray for Boston, right? Um, but still, Huntington Avenue would not be such a scary, windy, cold place if there were more stores and wider sidewalks and yeah. slower traffic and more people. Is, the sidewalk is in black mirror. Yeah. You don't want to be on that street. No wonder we like the bridges because the alternative is not nice. It's scary. The cars are going so fast, right? But the paradigm of the 21st century is never, always, never, never put a bridge, never put an alternative to walking on the street. Always push people out of your building onto the street. And that's what makes it safer. And then do lots of street neck downs so that you are design you're being very clear in the physical built environment. You're sending a message. People, 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 people. Cars, okay, we're not gonna get rid of cars, but people. Cars, slow down. Start behaving yourself. Be civil. Don't be such a jerk when you get behind the wheel. Right? Because something happens to the human brain when we get behind the wheel. We become drivers, and it's different than being a pedestrian. So cities throughout the world are now doing this. They're saying no to this, yes, sidewalks all the time, bodies on the sidewalks. So the next thing uh, that we're going to rush through, we talked about the panopticon, right? Remember the panopticon? What's the panopticon again? Central tower that surveils. Yeah, this is not the most extreme version because in the extreme version, there's just a slit, and the guard looks through the slit at the prisoners, and it's dark inside. And you can't tell when the guard is looking at you and when the guard is not looking at you, so you always have to assume that the guard might be looking at you, so you never kill your cellmate. You never, you never do anything that might get you in trouble because the guard might be looking at you. And this is accurate, except for the door. What the, the more sophisticated version of this is there's a tunnel and a spiral staircase, so the guard can come and go, and you can't tell. You don't see the guard coming and going. So there might never be a guard in there, ever. But there, he might be there, and he might be looking at you, right? So that's a powerful force. This is the literally the cartoon version of how architecture can operate as an instrument of control and oppression. So the panopticon is at the far extreme of control. Um, and what new ID uh, asks you to have a photo taken both the usual and then from the side? Is there a new state? Or is it global entry? Prison. Well, there's the mugshot. Yeah. But the mugshot front and side view has now shifted. We, I think we use it for global. Has anyone applied for global entry? Uh, you just whisk through the TSA checkpoints in the airport. Um, there is some, I should look this up, but there is some uh, identification system where you need two photographs one from the front, one from the side, that is so that the, the CAD software, because they use architectural software, and because you guys are all skilled in this three-dimensional electronic modeling, you could be interviewed, you could get a job with the security authorities helping them with their spatial modeling. They are spatially modeling uh, every human on the planet so that when, and this is the London system, which is the most extensive urban environment uh, of surveillance cameras. It's not just surveillance cameras, it is spatial modeling. So the camera is much more high resolution than this um, implies. They can actually zoom in and to this face, and they can model the location of the eyes in relationship to the other features. The topography of the human face is a unique signature. And but at that distance, they can identify 
the topography of the human, compare it to the database, and say, oh yeah, that is uh, Ali Katir Chioglu. Uh, he was last seen at the airport. He came into the country. And they can do that for every human in downtown London, is compare to see if they're, they exist on the database. And so as the database expands, that's what we do. We don't have time for this. Um, but this is, um, when we do cover this in history of architecture, postmodernism, we like to look at Denise Scott Brown, Robert Venturi's work on Las Vegas. And it connects to next week's topic. So let me just very quickly say that the key thing to take away from learning from Las Vegas is that the experience of the strip in Las Vegas, who's been to Las Vegas? Who loves Las Vegas? Isn't it great? I love it. And I hate it. I love and hate it. But the architecture of Las Vegas has to stand out. Every, everybody's competing to be, you know, look at me, look at me. You have to be able to recognize and take in the architectural uh, iconography at the speed of an automobile. And so uh, in order to be seen and register at the speed of the automobile, you need to be Frank Gehry-ish about your architecture. It needs to stand out. Your architecture has to operate like a giant billboard, a giant signpost. And that is, in a way, the core formulation that uh, characterizes postmodern architecture, is that it works like uh, an icon. It works like uh, a billboard. It's not the quiet modernism of, I'm going to use concrete exposed to be economical and create public housing for everybody. I'm going to put up a building that acts like a giant signboard so that I get seen. And that's um, how it works. And that's the footprints. There are object buildings in the sea of parking. It explains a lot. It's the opposite of what I was saying about formal, spatial, institutional. It's just form. Architecture is an object in the infinite plane of the American landscape, which we pave for parking. And the 110 degree heat accumulates to 120 degrees because the parking lot heats up. Okay.